Our Portland Trail Blazers have done it. We have won the NBA Finals, but now the question is, what's next? So let's start by recapping the last episode real quick. Game six of the NBA Finals in Detroit against the Pistons, and this was certainly a challenging series. We lost the first two games at home. Our best player gets injured. We're in a lot of trouble, but we find a way to win four games in a row, three of which were on the road, led by an unbelievable performance in Game 6 from Finals MVP and regular season MVP, Darius Springer with 43, 21, and 13, capping off one of the most impressive individual playoff runs in NBA history. And obviously it was a challenging finals for him. He got injured late in game one, really struggled in game two, couldn't play to his role the next few games. He had to play off the ball, but he still found a way to be productive. Springer was great the entire run of the playoffs. Every game that he was healthy and played at least 25 minutes, he got a double-double. Shaden Sharp, inconsistent offensively throughout the entire playoffs, but gave us some good moments, played great defense down the stretch. Khalil Griffin, inconsistent offensively during the playoffs, but very consistent in the finals. His efficiency was lower than his standards, but he still had a true shooting percentage of over 61, which is quite good. And then there's Scoot Henderson, who really stepped it up during the finals. Had he played well in Game 6, I think he would have won the finals MVP, but ultimately Springer helping us win that last game with his dominance was the difference, in my opinion, to him winning the award, capping off an incredible playoff run for our team. It's been a really fun ride seeing these guys grow and develop over the last couple of years. This season in specific, it really felt like this was the year for us to win the title, and we do that with a dominant regular season, a dominant playoff run. But now the question is, what's next? Because we still have to write the final chapters and close the book with this core. I want to see what the core four can do of Darius Springer, Shaden Sharp, Scoot Henderson, and Khalil Griffin. Because I think these guys have multiple championships left in them. That starts here with the offseason, and we've got to pay Darius Springer. He's a free agent, but he's not the only one. We've got a number of other guys not under contract this year, most notably Zay Logan. We have a lot of guys under contract. We still have to pay Khalil Griffin next year, so it's going to be challenging paying all these guys. Obviously, Springer is going to be number one priority, but Zay Logan is a guy who I would love to have back for the right price. Thing is, I think he's going to command a lot of money, and I think he could really flourish in a bigger role elsewhere. So given the opportunity, we will look to bring him back, but we can't necessarily overpay, per se. Let's get through the entirety of the offseason to get ourselves ready for Season 6 as we do some abbreviated seasons to wrap up the series, and that starts with retirements. Headlined by Stephen Curry, wrapping up a 19-year career, all of which were with the Golden State Warriors. Tobias Harris, Bradley Beal, and Rudy Gobert are amongst the other notable names here. No Damian Lillard, though. He said he was looking to retire when we acquired him during the trade deadline. Clearly, he has other plans. In terms of the coaches that retire, one of our assistants, Scott Brooks, retires on top, former head coach with the Washington Wizards. Stephen Curry obviously makes the Hall of Fame. He also gets his number 30 retired by the Golden State Warriors. That'll bring us into the league meetings. We are going to approve one. The step-in rule is no more. I want to give teams a little bit more freedom here now that we're getting closer to the end of the series, and now they can trade first-round picks in back-to-back -back years. Some teams may really screw themselves over by doing this, but honestly, if you do, it's your own fault. Now into the draft lottery. We have no lottery picks, but I do want to see how things unfold. The Dallas Mavericks get the 16th pick. 15 goes to Milwaukee. The 14th pick goes to the Celtics. Toronto moves into the top four. So a big jump already. The Raptors, who lost in the play-in tournament, now the top four pick. Since then, we have no changes here in the lottery as the Grizzlies, who currently have four first-round picks, land at number 10. Nine goes to Seattle, meaning both Boston and Oklahoma City move into the top four. And then the Hawks get eight, meaning Indiana slides into the top four, which means there's no suspense for the next couple of picks. The Grizzlies, Wizards, and Venom get screwed. And that brings us to four. And what I believe is a three-player draft. You don't want the fourth pick. And it goes to Boston via Miami. They did not get that pick from the Heat, though. They got that pick from us in the Kristaps Porzingis deal. 
Number three goes to the Raptors, and we are down to two. The second pick goes to the Oklahoma City Thunder, which means for the first time in franchise history, the Indiana Pacers will be picking number one overall. They've already got a pretty talented roster core with Tyrese Halliburton, Larry Markkinen, and R.J. Barrett, the latter of whom is a free agent this offseason. So I'm curious to see how they handle that. Oklahoma City at two is fascinating as well, given all the talent they have on their roster. We don't have any first-round picks this year because, well, we traded it to Boston for Porzingis. We do have a second-rounder, and we do have plenty of picks in the future, including the Wizards' first next year, which is very valuable. We added some new members to the staff. That brings us to the NBA Draft Combine. Here are the leaders at their respective positions. We went over a lot of these prospects earlier in the season in a prospect profile. In case you missed that episode, I recommend you check out the series playlist. Also in the playlist is the video that shows how to download my draft class. So if you would like to use these players, and not only are you downloading the draft class, but you're also downloading the save file in a sense. So technically, you guys can pick up right where I left off at this point in the series with either our team or a different team. You're also going to be able to download player DNA as well. I've gotten a lot of questions about that. I know there's a lot of people who want to get to use Darius Springer, which I don't blame you. He's pretty fun to use. So this way you can download his player DNA, whether it's at his current MVP form, or you can download a save file of a different season and use a younger version of Darius Springer. So these are the final results for the pre-draft workouts. I wanted to look at some guys who could fall to our second round pick or could be trade-up options. In terms of the notable performers, guard at Jalen Tint is a guy who really stood out. 25 reps on the bench in particular as a 6'3 guard. I have a hard time thinking he's going to slip out at the top 20, but he did really impress me. I imagine he impressed other teams as well though, so he probably will go quite early. In terms of the shooting drills, I thought some of the bigs ended up performing pretty well. Some of the bigs, such as Nike Binder and Preston French, both performed quite well. And that brings us to the NBA draft. So we'll see if Portland chooses to make some moves or if they stand pat. With the first pick, the Indiana Pacers select Amonzo Evers from Georgia Tech. I said it was a three-player draft after the lottery. I think this is not only one of those three guys, but I think it's the right choice. I think he's got the highest ceiling of any player in this class. I think he's going to be a stud for them. Reese Wallum, the second overall pick to Oklahoma City. Dynamic passer. I think him and Shea in the backcourt, if they start together, will be really fun. And then Cairo Skranko, the Greek wing, goes to the Raptors. The three players who were expected to go in the top three do. And now I think this is really where the draft opens up. At number four, that starts with the Celtics, and they select Devin Grimes, a wing out of Michigan. The Celtics are in a weird spot because they've got all their star players still. They have two lottery picks. Will this be enough for them to potentially put themselves back in a contention? Roman Dumbu out of Houston goes to the Venom here at pick five. They hope that him and Zaylin Moon can be the backcourt of the future in Las Vegas. With the sixth pick, the Washington Wizards select Jalen Tent out of Kentucky. I'm surprised he went this high, but again, I guess he was as impressive in other workouts as he was with us. With the seventh pick, the Grizzlies select Sincere Osborne Harper. This is the John Morant replacement, one of the youngest players in the class. I think he's a little bit raw, but he's got a lot of upside. And for a Grizzlies team who's just starting their rebuild, I can't blame them for swinging for the fences. Hakeem Palmer out of Baylor goes to Atlanta here at number eight, gets him another guy who can space the floor, play some defense. With the ninth pick, the Seattle Sonics select Malik Thompson from Georgetown. He's an athletic forward who is a little bit raw. I think the defensive and shot upside is there, but this is another swing on upside for a team who is, again, rebuilding. And then the Grizzlies back on the clock select Manikar Mbobo, the big center out of USC. Dominant Peyton presence. I think he's pretty athletic for his size, 7'2", 255. Let's move a little bit faster now through the first round. Hudson Nguyen goes to the Sixers. Keyshawn Carrizo, an intriguing high school prospect, goes to the Nuggets. Javante Sparks from Stanford. I'm surprised he fell this far, goes to the Knicks. Lion Slane goes to Boston. We've got a trade here at 15. The Grizzlies moving back into the first round, sending Josh Christopher and Austin Reeves to Milwaukee. The Bucks add a couple rotation players, and the Grizzlies get another pick. They select Cole Whittle from Iowa. Preston French, he's a guy we liked, ends up with Dallas. Cliff Santana goes to Memphis at 17. And now we are starting to call some teams looking to move up because there's a player who's fallen a little bit who I really want. 
We're going to try to make this work without giving up anything super valuable. I think maybe some sort of package of Marvin Bagley and our own first round pick next year would be pretty fair. The Sixers say, no, I'm not willing to go any further. I'm not giving up the Washington pick next year. They select Khalid Kamal. Good player, but not my target. We're going to try again with Golden State at 19. Teams seem to want Chris Tapps Porzingis. We're not looking to trade him, though. The Warriors can't come up with a deal. They select Nike Binder. We were really impressed with him with the pre-draft workouts. Not the player we were looking to move up for, but I do like him quite a bit. The Suns at 20 don't seem to be over willing to make a trade. They didn't even have anything in the trade finder, so they say no. And they ultimately select Pierre Armani Moon Jr. from Alabama, who put on a show at the Combine. That brings us to 21. Dijon Davis goes to New Orleans. And now Minnesota here at 22. And they seem to be much more willing to make a deal. I think we can make something work here. Look at this last trade. We don't even have to give up our first round pick next year. It's basically Marvin Bagley for the 22nd pick. But we're swapping first next year. Getting the better of Minnesota or Washington's pick. We got Marvin at the trade deadline from Minnesota. They missed him that badly that they're willing to give up a first round pick to get him back. And with that, we are on the clock. We invited four of these guys to pre-draft workouts, and I also really like Amon Thomas as well. I didn't think he'd fall this far. So which one of these five players will be the selection? With the 22nd pick in the 2028 NBA Draft, the Portland Trailblazers select Terrence Apprenter Jr. He's a high school prospect, one of the youngest players in this class. I think he's raw, but I really like the upside. He plays with his head above the rim, a vertical athlete who can get up there. His defensive profile is what makes us excited, though. He can guard bigs down low. He's got the size, length, and strength to do it. I get this is the McDonald's All-American game, which is an all-star game, but we're still seeing some of his defensive flashes. At 6'11", 210, he's got the size and quickness to play onto the perimeter as well. If he hits his ceiling, he's going to be one of the best defensive players in the league. His offensive game could use some work. I think he's a little bit raw and will mostly spend this year in the G League, but I love his ceiling. Elijah Abraham goes to the Grizzlies. Of the guys left who we had invited for workouts, I thought it was most likely that he would go in the second round, fall into our other pick. And all these guys are now flying off the board. Quintoris Space is gone. Amon Thomas is gone. There's only one left, and it's Joyner Yates who goes to the Lakers. So all the guys who we really liked are gone. I figured none of them were going to fall, but it is unfortunate. And that will wrap up the first round into the second now. We'll see what happens here until the seventh pick of the round, which we currently own. Anthony Corum's a guy who I was intrigued by. He goes to the Magic. Just a couple picks away now. Steve McClain to Golden State. Kitan Akinyemi to the Venom. And then Zane Griffin to the Seattle Sonics. That's Khalil Griffin's brother, and he was going to be the guy we would have picked. So unfortunately, we got pick sniped. We couldn't reunite the brothers, and now we're going to have to pivot a little bit here with our next choice. Ashton Wisham has a brother in this class as well who's on the board. Could he be the pick? With the 39th pick in the 2028 NBA draft, the Portland Trailblazers select Reuben Hill from South Carolina. No, we're not going to go for the cool family storyline. Instead, picking a guy in Hill who I think can be a really good 3 and D player. He's six foot five, but he plays bigger than that. And I think defensively, he'll be an asset. I love what he provides as a shooter. He can shoot the ball off the dribble, off structure, but he can also shoot it off the catch as well. He's a 21-year-old senior, four-year player for the Gamecocks. He's played a lot of basketball. He's battle-tested in the SEC, and I think he's a guy who could give us some minutes early on. So that is the NBA draft. Here is the full results of the first and second rounds. I think things worked out really well for us. Moving up to 22, getting a steal of the trade, and picking Terrence Apprenter the third. Somebody who, again, I don't think is going to play a lot for us this year, but I really like his ceiling. I also want to point out there's two Zedrick Cruises in the first round. I accidentally made him twice, so I will edit the second one with a different name. As for round two, we wanted Zane Griffin. Unfortunately, he goes one pick before us, but we'll settle with Ruben Hill, who looks like a pretty solid player in his own right, even though Griffin is younger and better. You can't win them all. It happens. 
Let's move into free agency, which I think is the most pivotal part of our offseason. Not so much with Darius Springer. We kind of know he's going to come back, but more so with Zay Logan. We've got three team options for Griffin, Suleiman, and Wisham. All three players are coming back. For the qualifying offer, we're not going to give it to Fritz Bengaro, but we will give it to Darius Springer. He's probably not going to need it. And then Zay Logan, who might need it. I'm curious to see what his market looks like. And that brings us into free agency with Nikola Jokic and Zion Williamson headlining the list. Springer is a big offer from the Suns. We'll match that if he accepts it, but I'd rather sign him for five years, and I think he'd probably rather that as well. Logan wants 31 a year. That's a lot of money for a role player. I love the guy, but that seems a bit steep. Let's start with Springer. We're going to give him a five-year maximum contract for nearly $270 million. He gets to make more money than the restricted free agents in this class because he is an MVP and a finals MVP. Obviously, he's going to take our deal. He's under contract for the next five years, which is very exciting. We're going to renounce everybody here other than Logan. That includes Damian Lillard. I kind of figured he would retire into the sunset. That would have been a better storyline because he wasn't really a factor for us in the playoffs, and I don't think it makes a lot of sense to bring him back. We've made it to the end of free agency. Lillard has an offer from the Bulls, but other than that, hasn't gotten a ton of interest. Zay Logan has some offers but has not accepted anything. He hasn't really gotten anything big. And his demands have gone down. So we're going to offer him a four-year deal for $25 million a year. That's around 100 But if you count the fact that he'll be making more money later in the deal, it's going to be more like $110 million. Let's look at free agency around the rest of the league. As Jokic returns to Denver, the Spurs were in on him. Him and Wemby would have been fire. Zion Williamson leaves New Orleans for the Pacers. I think this works out well for everybody. For Zion, he gets to join a fun team with Halliburton, Markinen, and the number one pick, Amonzo Evers, while the Pelicans get to really focus on all the young talent they currently have. Kevin Durant is back on the Suns. I don't really know why, but okay. He will pair up with his former Miami Heat teammate, Jimmy Butler. It didn't work with the Heat last year. Why do they think it's going to work now? That might be the oldest super team ever. Pretty much everybody else returned to their former teams, other than Anthony Davis, who goes back to the Lakers after a couple years in Charlotte. And Zay Logan accepts our deal four years for 112. It's a lot of money for a bench player, but I think it's worth it for Zay, and he'll be back for the next four years. That brings us into player progression now. I think player progression won us the finals last year. So I was curious to see what happens here. Springer goes up a bit. Khalil Griffin up three. He is an 89. Caleb Marsh goes up five, although part of that was his position change from point guard to small forward, but he is now the highest rated player off the bench. Plus three for Logan, minus one for Ochai. That's not ideal, but he is 28, so regression will start to come for him. Suleiman and Wisham go up quite a bit. I was hoping for a bigger boost from Wisham, but I do think he will be good enough to be a regular rotation player. This is what the Summer League team looks like. Our first round pick, Terrence Apprenter, is nowhere to be seen. I don't know why he's not on the roster, but we ended up going 0-3. The Caleb Marsh show did not quite go to plan. Marsh was abysmal. He shot 34% from the field. Ashton Wisham was solid, although the star of the show was Dante Cormier, who was picked off off the street right before Summer League. We'll see if we can win this first round game against Atlanta, and unfortunately we don't. So Caleb Marsh and Ashton Wisham lead the team to an 0-4 record. Cormier with 31-12, and Marsh with 20 on 22 shots, Wisham with 10 on 13 shots. They both shot tour dates. The Warriors beat the Clippers in the finals. Golden State led by the duo of Mars Ingram, Giovanni Merritt, and Dejon Hill. Three big pieces for them in the future. The first two guys, of course, they got from New York in the Donovan Mitchell trade. All the California teams except for the Kings made it to the semis, but, well, the Kings are better than those teams at actual basketball, so they make up for it. Los Angeles will be the host of All-Star Weekend, and that now brings us to the regular season. I do want to point out, though, I did try to sign Damian Lillard here once the regular season started, but unfortunately, he was insulted by our contract offer. I tried to sign Dante Cormier. He was so good in the summer league. His ratings look really intriguing. He's a monster scorer. He doesn't want to do it either. So, unfortunately, neither of those guys will be on the roster. Let's look at the rotation here to start Season 6. Same starters as last year. The bench is as expected. All guys who were on the team last season. The two rookies will start the year in the G League. And hopefully, with the fact that these guys 
all have chemistry together. They all want a title together that will be in position to potentially win another one. Next episode, we're going to go through the entirety of season six, regular season and playoffs as we look to win championship number two. Hope everybody enjoyed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.